never set out to go into the business of email. Right. Um, I got to graduate school, and Carnegie Mellon at the time, I think still, had a thing called the Lieberman queue. And grad students had to be in a queue, and when their number came up, they were assigned a sort of community service to the department. Um, and mine was maintaining this ancient email system on TOPS 10. And uh, it, was, it was such a crufty system that I got motivated to just rewrite a system on Unix. So I wrote a mail system there. And then I thought, well, that's enough of that. And I, um, I did my thesis in, in, in user interface design. And then uh, um, at, when I was looking for jobs post-thesis, after I'd gotten, gone on all my interviews, uh, my thesis advisor, who was also the head of the Andrew Project, said, how would you like to stay here for a while and build the world's greatest mail system? Email was a text thing in English only. Um, there were extensions that had been made for other languages, but they only worked within national or linguistic communities. So if a Japanese person went to uh, France and used a computer there, he wouldn't be able to read Japanese email. Um, so that was clearly not an optimal situation. Also back then, we didn't have just the internet. We had a whole bunch of networks. Uh, we had BitNet, we had Usenet, there were uh, NSFNet, and people sent mail to each other across these networks. They were connected by gateways that were um, uh, not always perfect, because it wasn't, wasn't always possible to um, preserve all of the information exactly the way it was intended. So the way I like to put it is, I've never met a gateway that made a message better, right? Uh, you know, the best you can hope for is that it doesn't make it worse. So there were a number of problems. Um, and, and I came from a research background where I had built a system that did multimedia mail, uh, which meant you could have pictures and sounds and animations and all sorts of stuff that was, was relatively ahead of its time. I was part of a team at Carnegie Mellon that did that. And uh, what really got me thinking standards uh, was this. One day, Steve Jobs came to visit, and we demoed the Andrew Message system to him, and he immediately tried to hire our whole team, and nobody went. You know, I suspect that was one of his worst days ever in hiring. Um, so he went home, this was when he was with Next Computers, and he put together a team to build a multimedia mail system. So Next Mail is sort of a, um, an imitation of the Andrew mail system. And, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. That's wonderful. I didn't have any problem with it. But once it was built, it was hard to ignore the fact that while my users could send pictures to each other and his users could send pictures to each other, my users couldn't send pictures to his users because we weren't doing it the same way. So I started thinking there really needs to be a standard here. Now, simultaneously, there are a lot of people almost all outside the U.S., worrying about the language problem, worrying about getting um, non-English characters and in other languages into email. And there was a third problem. There were people who worked on gateways, these, these, this, these, this gateway problem I described before, who wanted standards for formatting that would make it possible to gateway a higher level of information to some of these other systems. So what MIME was, was a fortuitous uh, coming together of those three needs. And uh, the man who deserves credit for uh, starting that process was a man named Einar Steferud, who was one of the um, great unsung heroes of the internet. He was on the internet from the early 70s. Uh, he started the first internet mailing list. Um, so he was, um, he was a, a, a pioneer in many ways. He was also kind of ornery and I think didn't get as much uh, credit as he should have because of that. He passed away a few years ago. Anyway, he introduced me to Ned Fried. Ned was working on gateway issues. Um, we quickly met a lot of people who were interested in the language issue, and I was interested in the, um, the multimedia issue, and quickly found that we could put together a solution for all of those things. And what's good about that from a standards perspective is bandwagon. All those people who don't care about multimedia mail get it because they want to get the multilingual mail. When you put together those three motivations I mentioned, multimedia, multilanguage, and, and gateway, um, you had a lot of people concerned. And it doesn't matter how, good, how much goodwill you have. Uh, when you have that many people involved, there's going to be differences of opinion. Um, I'd say there were about 70 people involved, not all of them as, as actively as others. Um, and it, it took us about a year and a half, I think, uh, to produce a, what we considered a, a stable first draft, the first one that was published as an RFC. And it was a roaring success, almost overnight. Um, one reason, I think, 
was that um, the whole time I was uh, writing the draft, um, I had a program called MetaMail that I had written, and I was updating it to follow each version of the draft. And what MetaMail did was it allowed you to make a very simple patch to existing text-only mail systems, and it would call programs that could display the MIME parts. So all of a sudden, these ancient systems with a very little amount of work started working uh, with this, this cool stuff, languages, pictures. And so that made it, that made the adoption incredibly fast. In fact, we released the MIME standard and then I released the MetaMail software and I started getting patches for it, you know, people augmenting it the next day. And within the first week, this was a Unix program, within a, f the first week, I got the patches for the DOS port and the Amiga port. And at that point, I was pretty sure I was onto something. <laughs> Pretty much trace what we're doing today all the way back to it, that it, it's, it's been very linear and it actually hasn't evolved all that much um, and I, I'm tempted to say that's because we did a lot of things right but um, l lest I sound arrogant I, I also need to say that mime is one of the ugliest things I've ever seen I mean, it's a it's a tower of hacks you know, honestly it is and that's one of the reasons it was successful uh, we had a tremendous problem or issue of compatibility with the installed base. You know, even then there were probably millions of people using email around the world and a lot of software that uh, wasn't going to be thrown out. And so there were a lot of things that were constrained and that led to mine being ugly, but because it was designed with that in mind, um, it, it, was, it was ready for adoption. Another reason it didn't have to evolve that much is that it, it, it was almost a version two of something else in one sense, which is X400. X400 was the email standard from the uh, OSI protocol stack, which was supposed to replace the whole TCP IP stack uh, and never did. Um, and we looked, a lot of us looked at X400, which was tremendously complex and would be very hard to integrate with existing mail systems. And so our more simplified approach uh, was a reaction to that. And that's why you have some things in uh, MIME that you would never design if you were designing from, from scratch. So for example, 80 column lines. I mean, the limit's a little longer than that, but basically limited line lengths. Why is that? It dates back to uh, teletypes. Actually, it goes further back than that. It goes back to punch card machines um, because the first video terminals had 80 columns so that they could easily handle punch cards because they had interoperate and just went on from then. So basically, your mail today is limited to 80 column lines more or less, um, because punch card machines were 100 years ago. Um, so we made th this ugly thing uh, to be backwards compatible, and that's why it, it took off like a rocket, I think. Another reason it took off like a rocket was that as we were finishing it up, uh, I got mail from a fellow who was working on this, um, this project in Switzerland I'd never heard of, and he said, um, I'm working on the project called the World Wide Web, and um, right now it's text only, and we're looking for how to um, make it multimedia, and we were thinking that mine might be the way to do it. Do you have any uh, opinions or ideas? And so um, having the web pick up mime did not hurt in having it take off like a rocket either. And what it really picks up is effectively the typing of various, the, yeah. the ability to mark in the, a common language between mime and yeah. HTTP. Yeah, there are several parts of mime, and, and certainly they aren't all used by the web. Um, at its core, the most important part of mine, um, as you say, is the content type registry. So if I need to be able to send you some weird type of data that I've just invented, I have to label that somehow. And there's a way to label it for experimental stuff, but there's a registry to go to uh, for something that you want to be interoperable, semi-permanently at least. And um, 
when we released the MIME standard, I think it had 17 content types that defined something between 10 and 20. And last I looked, the uh, uh, IANA registry of MIME types was over 1,000. I think 1,200 or something. So, so, so that kind of extensibility did not hurt either, because a lot of people who had totally different motivations you know, for what they wanted to do had an easy way to identify the data for the web and for email. Yeah.